Hello, and welcome to Savage Bites, Season 3, Episode 27, Proximal Entity. A gruesome discovery at an abandoned church leads a skeptical police detective through the looking glass. Beyond the threshold of multidimensional space-time, something seeks a conduit to our own mundane realm of material matter. A searing flash of light burned away the dim interior of the abandoned church, leaving a smudgy afterimage that swam in his field of vision. Vaguely irritated at this interruption in his train of thought, he blinked reflexively as his eyes gradually readjusted to the gloom. The camera whined softly beside his ear, its thin reedy note rising steadily as the capacitor recharged for another shot. The man beside him who held the camera was equally thin, equally reedy in his way, his chinless face punctuated by a bristling broom of a moustache, the remnant of a bygone era, that jetted out beneath thick-rimmed glasses. A Christmas cracker combination the man wore, seemingly in ignorance of its mildly comical effect. The moustache rippled as he spoke. I've got what I need here, sir. I think I'll get going. Unless there's anything else. Detective Chief Inspector Archie Black glanced at the speaker, his fragile concentration broken anew. Nah, thanks, Phil. That'll be all. Satisfied, the police photographer quietly busied himself with his gear, leaving the detective to his own private thoughts. DCI Black resumed his silent contemplation, his rapt attention focused on the cryptic remains that lay at his feet. Remains whose discovery would perhaps bring to a conclusion, a case that had lain dormant, open and unsolved for the better part of six months. This was really something. A rare find and a puzzle. The kind of puzzle that had led Archie Black into the police service in the first place a decade before. The kind of rare find for which he had waited so very patiently as he steadily climbed the ranks. A discovery whose mere potentiality had made all those plodding hours and days and months of drudgery. The dragging mundanity of interviews, the prosaic cataloguing and collation of evidence, the endless vapid paperwork, all worthwhile. Diligently and attentively, he had sifted through the chaff of his days, sustained all the while in his patience by the fervent hope that he might one day stumble upon something inexplicable, something truly bizarre. Now it was here, before him, in all its gruesome perplexity. A bright shining needle of intrigue, exposed by chance out of the cumbrous haystack of a banal world. A needle whose successful apprehension would require an adroit hand. The body, or what remained of it, was in an appalling state of charred dismemberment. The thicker portion of the trunk was burned all away, leaving nothing but a consolidated crust of coal-black ash, at the centre of which lay a blackened belt buckle and a scattering of scorched copper fly buttons. The head was similarly charred, but remained largely intact, propped up against the angle of wall and floor, the face a ghastly parody sculpted in charcoal its features fringed in ash and grey. The cauterized stumps of hands and a portion of one leg below the knee remained curiously unharmed, neatly incised by what must have been a ferocious heat. Above this dissolute form, rising like the dead man's ghost, was a human image, seared into the mottled plaster, its cringing attitude telling its own mute tale of terror and mortal agony. What had happened here? What had caused such a ferocious fire, and how could it have reduced a grown man entirely to ash while leaving the structure around him, virtually untouched? Beside these remains lay a camera, its woven strap still looped around the charred stump of one detached wrist. Its pristine condition, like that of the hand itself, was an anomaly in light of the charred state of its late owner mere inches away and the detective was immediately gripped by a keen curiosity regarding the contents of the film he anticipated might be found within the dark confines of its glossy black housing. With infinite care, he unwound the dusty strap, freeing the camera from the severed hand that had once wielded it. Black had always felt that there was something dubious about the obsessions of the photography buff. 
He felt that there was something strange and out of kilter with anyone overly consumed by the capture of the frozen image. There was something distinctly voyeuristic in its intent, something positively predatory in its execution. To his mind, it was the pastime of the loner and the outcast, an unhealthy infatuation whose manifestation might hint at a concealed capacity for perversion, even depravity. A neck on F3, Phil said, matter-of-factly, his nasal voice breaking the lingering silence. A rare bit of quality kit, that, for its time very capable. It'd be interesting to see what's on that film, eh? Assuming it's not spoiled. He shrugged. Black caught the man's eye and held it, his previous train of thought lingering momentarily. Let's satisfy our curiosity, he said with quiet gravity. Take it with you to the lab. See what you can find. Returning his attention to the charred remains, DCI Black noticed an object that had so far escaped his attention. There, at the edge of the charred heap that had once been a living man, laying half buried beneath it was a wallet. The leather was scorched and blackened and eaten away at the corners, but the object was otherwise intact. Retrieving it gingerly with a gloved hand, he flipped it open. Inside was a plastic NatWest bank card in the name of Mr. Edward M. L. Bridge, along with a credit card and a partially scorched paper driver's license, both held under the same name. This was him. That much was evident. In the quiet confines of the deserted edifice, Black mulled over the curious course of events that had culminated in this enigmatic discovery. The disappearance of Mr. Bridge had been reported by his aging mother the previous spring in late April. The report had been recorded, but no serious investigation undertaken given the frequency of such reports, coupled with the doubtful mental state of the decrepit old deer. Bridge had been an author of some little regard, having focused his efforts on the sometimes lucrative yet always dubious subject of the supernatural. Investigations into what he himself dubbed the outre scientific. The man had a history of curious and erratic behaviour, and the chief superintendent was ill-disposed to expend valuable resources in tracking down a confirmed crackpot who would more than likely turn up sooner or later in the natural course of things. The old lady, however, had other ideas and remained persistent, insisting that in this case things were different. As the weeks passed, her calls became increasingly disruptive and a threat to take the matter to the press, pointing out the force's sheer negligence regarding the matter of her only son's baffling disappearance, finally prompted the chief to act. The case was dropped onto DCI Black's desk and at first he too was reluctant to pursue it but his disinclination quickly turned to attentiveness at what he was to discover. The subject of Bridges' latest book, whose notes and accumulated research to which Black was subsequently given access by the concerned mother, was the baffling enigma known to the wider world as spontaneous human combustion. The conundrum had a long and storied history dating back as far as the 15th century. Many mundane theories had been advanced over the years connecting such cryptic deaths to the vagaries of alcoholism or the risks of smoking late at night. The wick effect of rendered human fat explaining the baffling confinement of such fires to the body itself, leaving nearby furnishings oddly unharmed. None of these explanations had proved wholly convincing, unable as they were to explain all the particulars of the perplexing anomaly. Bridge had accumulated a comprehensive body of evidence, including a raft of police and coroner's reports, augmented by the circumstantial testimony of a broad swath of witnesses spanning several centuries. He had, furthermore, embarked upon his own research and gone as far as to conducting his own practical experiments, which Black was, in light of his current predicament, forced to conclude had proved an unmitigated success. Though it now seemed clear these experiments had culminated in a pyrrhic victory of the most literal complexion. The man's research notes were copious, jotted out in a hurried and abstruse hand that followed a rambling, non-sequential thread of surmise and conjecture which proved all but impossible to untangle. The little black was able to make of it, he translated to the best of his understanding in his own case notes. The core of the man's researches and experimentation centred on a theory regarding a hitherto unforeseen connection between the anomaly and certain specific lighting conditions that he attested had played an obscure but crucial role in each and every case. The most recent glut of cases being, 
in his view, inextricably connected to the modern prevalence of the cathode ray television set, aspects of whose operation he was convinced were, under certain circumstances, readily capable of creating whatever specific conditions were necessary for the reproduction of the deadly aberration. The notion that such benign rays as those given off by an ordinary television set could produce such shocking results seemed ridiculous. But as Black read on, with growing fascination, doubts had begun to skulk furtively at the bulwarks of his stolid Presbyterian conceptions. His gear finally packed away, Phil Howard made his way toward the door, pausing at the threshold as a parting thought occurred to him. I'll have the crime scene shot developed for you this afternoon, along with whatever I can recover from the Nikon. The detective replied without looking up. Leave them on my desk, would you, Phil? DCI Archie Black sat in the warm sanctuary of his private office at the station, nursing a generous tumbler of Glenfiddich in uncharacteristically nervous fingers. He had, over recent weeks, painstakingly translated the copious, chaotic, and at times bizarre notes of Edward Bridge. They were doubtless the conjurations of a disturbed mind, representing such a departure from the known sciences, as far as DCI Black understood them, that only the most credulous devotee of the supernatural could lend them credence. Despite this rationale, he had been forced to admit, as his work progressed, that they followed a through line of uncanny consistency, despite the hectic cast of those ramblings, and in spite of his better judgment, he found himself unable to wholly dismiss them. The theory, so far as he could ascertain, held that a wider reality existed beyond the physical dimensions to which we human beings are granted access by our limited senses. That there are hidden dimensions coexistent with our own, dimensions occupying the same region of space-time yet subtly offset or askew in a manner difficult to describe and almost impossible to grasp. Dimensions as insubstantial to our narrow comprehension as the dream world portrayed in the flickering rays of a television set, yet as real, as complex, and as predatorially competitive as our own. His theory went on to propose that these other dimensions were the habitat of entities whose nature and modes of existence were wholly alien to our own conception, that rare and unusual manifestations or incursions of such beings into our material plane formed the definitive root cause of the vast majority of supernatural occurrences encountered from time to time by a perturbed humanity. In his notes, he laid charge that these extra-dimensional entities formed a ready scientific explanation for the hitherto inexplicable phenomena of ghosts and poltergeists and other more malignant and destructive intrusions of so-called occult supernaturalism. That on rare occasions such malign spirits had actually been photographed or recorded was a fact readily accepted by the general public, yet derided by the scientific community. Bridge had set out to remedy what he saw as an obstinate refusal of the evidence by proving his theory once and for all and setting out his findings in a book. He hoped he would raise his status from fringe charlatan to renowned and celebrated scientific pioneer at a single stroke. Removing his reading glasses and setting them on the desk, Archie Black massaged his tired eyes with forefinger and thumb, and he was mildly vexed to note that the ghostly afterimage that had plagued him earlier in the day still floated and flickered faintly at the centre of his vision. Casting such trivialities aside, Black shuffled through the cryptic pictures strewn across his desk, the photos Phil had resurrected from the film found in a dead man's camera. What he saw in those indistinct exposures was inconclusive at best, but there was something sinisterly provocative in the play of light and shadow that disturbed his normally stoic sensibilities, exciting a nervous tension to which he was wholly unaccustomed. This was what he had waited for for so long, a puzzle whose enigmatic circumstances had piqued his interest almost from the first, an interest that had quickly developed into an alarming fascination the deeper he delved into its startling precepts. The case demanded satisfaction, but he could not, for the sake of his reputation, attribute the man's cryptic demise to the incursions of some malign entity from another dimension, though by this point he was genuinely ready to entertain the theory. He would, of course, have to test it for himself, and God willing, obtain some concrete evidence in support of what, 
without it would surely be considered an outlandish claim. A claim that might bring his own sanity into question, should he level it without damning and incontrovertible proof. In Bridges' most recent notes, those entered shortly before his reported disappearance, he outlined the subtle conditions required to provoke an incursion from the outside, as he put it. A highly specific set of criteria was demanded. Only rare, psychically primed locations were apt to engender a successful result, and only then at sporadic and highly specific times, the final impelling component being provided by the timely application of a certain frequency of fast flickering light. No detailed explanation was offered as to how or why such a light might bring about the staggering results described, but the man's scrawled notes hinted that, in some inexplicable way, the flickering light pried open a temporary portal, interleaving this disparate new dimension with our own, creating what he oddly described as a corpus callosum or bridge between our material world and the phantasmal dimensions beyond. Midnight found the detective at the church once more. Ducking beneath the loose wrappings of crime scene tape, he pushed his way through the narrow opening between the heavy wrought iron gates that let into the yard. He crossed the dark void in silence, his path traced dimly by a wandering spot of torchlight that sent queer, elongated shadows leaping and dancing into the gloom. Outside, in the world beyond the dark expanse of the churchyard, the acid orange glow of sodium lights bleached the benighted streets, their caustic aura blotting out the moon and the stars overhead, contracting the scope of his world to a narrow bubble, stained in a sickly and natural flickering phosphorescence. Earlier, he had taken the dead man's camera from the evidence room. Four fresh AA batteries, purchased from a late night convenience store, had restored its bulky flash unit to full operation. Now he stood alone in the pitchy darkness of the vacant old church. What remained of the dead man after the cleanup crew had performed their morbid task lay before him. There was little to mark the spot, save a blackened stain on the dirty flagstones and that ghostly imprint seared into the crumbling plaster above. Black had no way of knowing whether or not tonight would play host to one of those rare and auspicious extrasolar alignments prerequisite to the successful trial of Bridges' theory. Instructions regarding the exact modus operandi required for the application of the light, if it had appeared in the dead man's rambling notes at all, had eluded him. Nevertheless, he felt a fierce compulsion to try, and undaunted by his lack of precise knowledge, he determined to improvise and trust to luck and his own better judgement. It was a few minutes past the hour. If any time of day were appropriate to such an eccentric task, it would be now. DCI Black clicked the little switch at the base of the flash unit that would charge the capacitor in preparation for a shot. The faint high whistle began, its pitch rising steadily as the seconds passed and the load increased. Black closed his eyes to protect his night vision and depressed the button triggering the first flash. Immediately he did so, he became aware of a subtle shift in things, of a new tension in the air, a tension he had not previously encountered. It was akin to the sensation of déjà vu, yet oddly distorted. A deep and sudden sense of guilt and dread descended upon him, a sense of existential foreboding so powerful that it momentarily sapped his strength. He became light-headed and suddenly confused. There was a cold hollow in his gut. Where was he? What was he doing here, at this time of night? As he swayed unsteadily, his hand clenched in reflex, his index finger again depressing the shutter release of the old Nikon. There was another searing flash of blinding brightness that vanished the next instant, leaving him blind and blinking, lost in utter darkness, save for a ghostly afterimage that flopped and flickered languidly, wherever he looked in the black void around him. The features of that grim church interior gradually re-emerged as his vision began to clear, like a ghost ship looming out of a benighted fog. And with it came something new, an eerie, ethereal glow. As his eyes readjusted, he watched it, transfixed by this strange, but not wholly unexpected manifestation, as predicted in the dead man's cryptic notes. The ghost light crept across the wall where the shadow of Edward Bridge had been seared into the plaster. It moved slowly, furtively, but with a rapid staccato flicker reminiscent of a zoetrope. 
There was something oddly animalistic, something deliberate in its stuttering movements that implied conscious intent. And as he watched its progress in grim fascination, Black began to divine its purpose. It was searching, carefully and tentatively in the dark, for some hint of its prey. There was something deeply unnerving in it, something malignant, something predatory that touched the veteran police officer like never before. The appearance of this strange trans-dimensional apparition was attended by a distinct drop in temperature, and it was this, perhaps, that startled him out of his torpor. Some preternatural flight response gripped him then, and before he knew it, he was fleeing through the dark, derelict graveyard, tripping and stumbling, heedless of the hurt to his shins in his haste to escape that haunting iridescence. The neck of the whiskey bottle clinked against the tumbler's rim as Black poured himself a stiff measure with shaky fingers. He downed its contents in one, grimacing at the corrosive heat that spread from throat to chest as he dosed out another measure. What he'd seen in that derelict church before he had fled had shocked and unnerved him. Just what he had expected to find upon testing the dead man's theory, he wasn't certain. Perhaps he'd hoped to disprove it, or at least to satisfy himself of its rank improbability. Instead, it had succeeded. Black was utterly nonplussed regarding just what had been called forth, but it was an undeniable fact, unless his mind or his senses had played him false, that something had come. Something alien, some intrinsic living, thinking entity. What had happened to it after his departure from the dilapidated church, he did not know. Perhaps, he thought, the evocative effect had dropped out of phase with the removal of the light. This was mere speculation, and he found that included in the hectic loop of repetitious thoughts that orbited the incident in his disturbed mind, there existed a fervent mantra of hope that the thing, whatever it had been, had returned to whichever shadowy dimension from whence it came. A sudden searing flash of light burned away the dim interior of DCI Black's office. Close on its heels came the high-pitched whine of the Nikon recharging. Shocked and temporarily blinded, Black moustached his eyes but a ghostly afterimage of the flash was once again burnt into his vision, as it had been earlier in the day. The image swam and flickered as he fought to blink it away. The instant he opened his eyes, there was another painful flash, followed by the now familiar whine as the camera flash recharged. What was wrong with it? How was it discharging all by itself? His vision hampered, Black fumbled blindly and frantically for the camera in the dark, scattering notebooks and photographic prints across the desk in his haste to lay hands on it. It flashed again and bidden as his fingers found it in the gloom, and he winced at the pain in his eyes caused by the close proximity of this fresh burst. Were those charging intervals growing shorter? There was yet another flash as that thought formed in his mind. It was followed by several more in rapid succession, confirming the suspicion. Black prized the flap open in growing alarm, spilling the batteries across the desk, removing the camera's source of power, leaving the familiar office around him in stark blackness. He felt its presence before he saw it, that distinctive drop in temperature, that creeping sense of ice-cold dread flooded over him as it had in the church. He shivered involuntarily, his skin crawling, his gut twisting and hollow, and he knew in that stifling moment of blind, clutching panic that it was back. The mirror had hung benign and scarcely noticed above the mantelpiece for many years. Now the familiar polished surface took on a startling new cast. It glowed with an eerie effulgence that was not reflected, but that emanated from within the glass itself, or out of dimensions beyond it. Its normally flat surface bulged and protruded at the centre, like a slow motion recording of a still pond into which a pebble has been dropped. A glittering, incandescent orb was suddenly bodied forth. It budded off, burst by the rippling surface of the mirror, and, floating serenely into the dim interior, commenced the probing of its new environment by means of a multitude of shifting, beam-like projections of focused light that flickered and moved and vanished by turns, only to be replaced the next instant by another. Blinding bright as it was, it utterly failed to illuminate the space about it, which remained mystifyingly dark and indistinct throughout. That rattled him perhaps as much as the shocking appearance of the thing itself, representing as it did, 
further proof that this extrinsic entity, whatever it might be, was not part of our mundane world, nor perhaps beholden to the normal laws of physics that govern it. Alien as the thing was, as alien as anything could be conceived to Black's conception, he nevertheless felt that he could sense intent in its cryptic movements. He somehow knew it sought him, that it was to some degree aware of his presence, and that even now it hunted him. He remained still, frozen in place, either by conscious choice or by paralyzing fear. He could not tell which, but sensing that as long as he did so, it might not be able to find him. He blinked a cold runnel of sweat from his eyes, and when he opened them, a split second later, the glowing orb was before him, hanging there, ethereal yet malign, mere inches from his face. A sickly, flickering thing dripping bright beads of liquid luminescence that scorched the floorboards at his feet. He could feel its fierce heat, it was so close. It burned bright now, so bright he couldn't bear to look at it. It quivered and flickered as it hung there. He could sense that, even through his tightly shut eyelids, and it crackled as it burned. He could do nothing but turn his face away as it glided nearer, and as it did so, it grew brighter, its vivid heat swelling and pulsating with excited intensity. The charred and all but unidentifiable remains of DCI Archie Black were discovered in his office the following morning, along with an incomplete case report, some additional notebooks, documents and photographs, and a Nikon camera belonging to one Edward M. L. Bridge, deceased. DCI Black's untimely demise was officially attributed to complications stemming from a secret yet burgeoning problem with alcoholism. A compulsion, which his superiors felt, might also have affected the detective's judgment toward the end. All details concerning DCI Black's investigations, and the puzzling details surrounding the disappearance and death of the late author, and those of the inspector's own untimely demise, were withheld from the press. Certain senior though unnamed authorities close to Westminster, deeming certain aspects of their content to run contrary to the public interest. You have been listening to Savage Bites, Season 3, Episode 27, Proximal Entity. I really hope you enjoyed this story. If you did, maybe hit the like button, and maybe even subscribe. And if you do that, might I urge you to also hit the notification bell so that you know when I upload my next story. The idea for this story began life as a concept art sketch that eventually gave birth to the illustration you see in the thumbnail and featured in the video. I was always fascinated as a kid by the supernatural in general, and spontaneous human combustion in particular. I remember seeing several gruesome photographs in books I'd borrowed from the library back when I was a kid. And often in those pictures there seemed to be a television set or a radio, some kind of electrical equipment that I kind of associated with, with, the, uh, with the phenomena, I guess. In a way, I guess it's a little bit of an homage to H.P. Lovecraft's last story, The Haunter of the Dark. Although the adversary in this story is a polar opposite to H.P.L.'s Haunter, in that it exists in light where his existed in utter darkness. I even went as far as to riff on a couple of the character names. The reporter found in the abandoned church in uh, Haunter of the Dark is called Edwin M. Lillibridge, and I based the name for my dead paranormal investigator on a riff on that. He's called Edward M. L. Bridge. Uh, I don't know if anyone noticed that. Also, the uh, police photographer is called Phil Howard. Obviously a little riff on H.P. Lovecraft himself. Uh, the DCI's name is also a tangential reference to Robert Block. So my character is Archie Black. Uh, but it's also there's a moth that's native to the south of England called Black Arches due to its peculiar markings. And I wanted to imply that moth motif to our central character. So just swapping those names around and tweaking it a bit, I got Archie Black. Um, because I wanted to imply very subtly that the, in the story the character is like a moth. He's drawn to the light that ultimately kills him. I guess in, in the 
the kind of effect that pries open the exterior dimensions with the lights flashing. I guess there's a hefty hint of uh, Crawford Tillinghast's device from HBL's From Beyond as well, which is one of my favourite stories of his. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you had some good fun with it. Yeah, there's more coming, so that's it from me for now. I shall see you in the next one.